McFarland Center is really pleased to present two lectures this semester in conjunction with a really exceptional Cantor Art Gallery exhibit called Dharma and Punya, Buddhist Ritual Art of Nepal. The exhibition, which is funded by a $100,000 grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities, is co-curated by Professor Todd Lewis, who's here, a distinguished professor of arts and humanities in the Religious Studies Department here at the College of the Holy Cross, and by Jenna Kim, professor of the history of art and architecture at Harvard University, and I think Jenna cannot be here today. Um, the exhibition is also, I want to point out, the swan song of a really wonderful, generous, very thoughtful director of the Cantor Art Gallery, Roger Hankins. As I understand it, this week is Roger's last week at Holy Cross, officially full week, and uh, I can assure him that uh, he will be deeply missed by many of us here. I've had the chance to work with Roger on a number of uh, exhibitions over the years, and the 16 years that he's been here. I realize I was on the committee that hired him, which makes it scary in terms of how long I've been here. Uh, but he's really brought uh, vision and warmth and uh, generosity and intelligence to the many exhibits he's done over the last 16 years, and I'm grateful. He has a wonderful eye, and I've heard many artists he's worked with talk about how well he hangs them and helps them think about their work as well. So Roger will be deeply missed, and he doesn't want to do that, but you can raise your hand. And, and thank you, Roger. My only consolation is that we get to welcome a new director, Meredith Fluke, whose committee, coincidentally, I was also on, so I know a little bit about her, and I know how talented she is and how lucky we are to find her. She's wonderfully qualified to build on Roger's legacy and help us with the transition to a new art gallery uh, up on the hill where that big hole is right now that you might have missed for parking. Uh, we're excited about that and I'm pleased to welcome her. I also, I don't usually do a lot of introductions and talks, but I'm really pleased to acknowledge and welcome Naresh Ranman uh, Bajracharya, who is a renowned uh, Noor Buddhist scholar practitioner from Nepal who's joined the Holy Cross community as a Fulbright Scholar for this year. Uh, it was a joy for me to see Naresh and John, our speaker, engaging each other just a little while ago down in the gallery to talk about things. So Naresh, uh, welcome to here. Um, finally, most importantly, it's my privilege to be able to welcome, uh, uh, to be able to enhance the exhibit with two great lectures. First, in, uh, in a moment, I'll talk about by the delightful John Guy of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And the second on November 14th by Holland Cotter, the chief art critic for the New York Times. Both lectures are part of the Deitchman family lectures on religion and modernity. I'm very grateful to Don, John Deitchman of the class of 1970 and his family for their support that makes it possible. John Guy is the Florence and Herbert Irving curator of South and Southeast Asian art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. He studied the ceramics of Southeast Asia, the Indian textile trade, the bronzes and sculptures of Southern India, and Indian miniature paintings. At the Met, he curated the landmark exhibition, Lost Kingdoms, Hindu-Buddhist sculpture of early Southeast Asia, fifth to eighth century. John has a really uh, wonderful talk for us today titled uh, Crowns of the Vajra Masters, Ritual Art and Esoteric Buddhist Practice in New Nepal. Or, yes. So, some variation on that. So anyway, please join me in welcoming John Guy. Thank you very much, uh, Tom. Uh, it's a great uh, pleasure to be here. And um, I must say, um, I want to express my thanks for the invitation to speak um, as part of the series for this very special exhibition that you, you've got on uh, currently downstairs. Uh, to thank t uh, Thomas Langley and, 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 and Ted, Todd Lewis um, for, for their invitation. Um, I have to say the exhibition is a special event in um, the presentation of, of Nepalese and especially Nawari art uh, to the West. Uh, and you've, uh, the two co-curators have brought together some wonderful material from, from major collections uh, across the country to make, make that possible. Um, I also must uh, say that I'm distinctly humbled to be presenting this lecture in the, in the presence of the Reverend Naresh Bhattacharya uh, from Kathmandu, who is one of the most esteemed scholars of Nawari uh, uh, Buddhist uh, ritual and Buddhist studies, um, and a great guru and teacher in his own right, as well as being the founding uh, vice chancellor of Lumbini uh, uh, Buddhist University. Uh, a great honor uh, to be speaking in front of you, sir, and of course, a great privilege for Holy Cross to have him in your presence for a whole year. Take advantage of it. Let me begin by um, 
saying a few words about uh, Vajracharya, because Vajracharya is going to come come up on your radar really rather frequently, and I think it needs a little explanation uh, to begin with. Um, Vajracharya essentially is the doctrine of the Vajra. What is the Vajra? The Vajra is um, a ritual utensil, as we understand it today. It has a physical form, uh, it's a double-pronged um, lightning strike uh, object, uh, but which embodies uh, an awareness of uh, the ancient, most ancient uh, uh, natural forces in the world. Um, it begins indeed, um, you might see here it is represented at Swayambhu, um, uh, uh, shown in this spectacular scale representation um, and embodies in a Buddhist context um, the uh, clarity of vision and wisdom uh, which comes through um, uh, advanced Buddhist practice and ultimately uh, through uh, an awakening. Vajracharya is, if you like, an esoteric branch of Mahayana Buddhism. Buddhism has its origins uh, going back to the lifetime of the Buddha um, in the 5th century BC, um, already um, within his lifetime and soon after was developing uh, various schools and trains of thought um, uh, and divergent ways of reading his teachings. Uh, one path st stayed on the very pure path which we see today practiced in Sri Lanka and some of mainland Southeast Asia, the Theravada tradition. The other tradition, uh, well, the Mahayana tradition, developed its own uh, esoteric path, including the uh, building of a large pantheon of supporting uh, uh, forms in a cosmic system, uh, direct uh, paralleling much of what uh, was happening in, in Brahmanical developments as well. And we get a pantheon of uh, bodhisattva figures, figures who are capable of divine intervention uh, to ensure uh, salvation of living, living creatures. Uh, those who study uh, this esoteric knowledge um, in Nepal um, are, are known as Vajracharyas. You're, you don't um, apply um, to take a course in Vajracharya studies, I'm afraid. You have to be born into it. It's, it's caste determined, um, as, as indeed, um, and we must not forget, of course, that Nepal is a predominantly Hindu community in which the Buddhists are a significant minority, but nonetheless a minority. And so within that system, the, uh, everyone's position is defined by caste, including that of the Buddhists. The Vajracharyas are uh, positioned uh, at a, a level you might crudely put, equate with Brahmins in, in, in Hinduism. Um, and just as a Brahmin male uh, is entitled to take priestly training, should he choose, um, and would be tutored as a child to have, a, to have the capacity to do that and make that choice later. Uh, so young boys born to Vajracharya families um, are trained and are given the, the option um, to enter uh, initially the monkhood and then subsequently to be um, go through a special uh, ceremony which would enable them to practice as masters um, of the Vajra, the Bodhisattva path uh, practitioners. And in this way they can offer uh, service to their wider community the way that Brahman priests do in a, in a Hindu, Hindu setting. But going back a moment, the origins of the Vajra are very ancient. Um, uh, they're linked, uh, certainly, uh, to storm gods, to Indic deities in, the, in South Asia and indeed West Asia, uh, the celebration of the, the personification of the natural forces in the world, including uh, the, the all-important um, uh, storm gods that, that ride in the clouds. This became Indra on, on his elephant, Erawan, um, coming in on the rolling clouds, which bring the announcement of the monsoon. And the monsoon is a central moment in the annual life cycle in the subcontinent. Without the coming of the monsoons, there is famine, uh, death, nothing grows. The, the monsoon delivery of the rains are a, a key defining moment. And that element was uh, personified in, in Indra and celebrated. And the iconography associated with Indra was lightning. 
uh, and one thinks back to Hellenistic and West Asian uh, prototypes for this, uh, and uh, certain West Asian de deities of, of both Zeus and, and Neptune um, have, the, have, the, have these associations. So we have here, uh, in a very early uh, Gandharan stucco relief from Hada, now destroyed, um, we see uh, the figure in this context, because it's a Buddha setting, we know he's intended uh, to represent uh, Vajrapani, the bearer of the Vajra. Um, here represented as this double-headed club, uh, faceted figure here, resting on his knee. We see him again uh, attending the Buddha during the turning of the wheel, the preaching of the first sermon in the deer park in Sarnath. That, that's what's referenced by the wheel motif, um, and the, the wheel is a very important metaphor for not only um, Dharma knowledge in Buddhist settings, but also for the sharing and spreading of knowledge. The wheels travel through time and, over, and through space, and with that carry the message of the Dharma. So uh, the Dharma wheel becomes very, very important symbol for the dissemination of Buddhist knowledge. Uh, and this was especially important, of course, in the early centuries of Buddhism, when it was evangelizing, when it was expanding in the subcontinent, um, and when um, they were, the uh, Buddha himself gave advice in his lifetime, as preserved in, the, in his canonical teachings, uh, that you should build stupas in places where they haven't been built before. You spread the Dharma, you extend the boundaries of the Buddhist faith. Um, and so the wheel symbol is very important in that respect. And it echoes, of course, one of the key symbols in early India for kingship. The Chakravartin is the king who turns the wheel, is a, a very important concept in early Indian thinking to do with kingship and the crossover between Buddhist secular kingship and uh, sacred kingship, i.e. the Buddha, uh, becomes an important uh, motif. Figures holding thunderbolt lightnings um, have been there from a very, very early time. Here we are in first century, 100, 150 AD, I would say, in Mathura, North India, uh, this extraordinary figure in which the lightning bolt motif that he's holding is virtually the size of a human figure. It's spectacular. Um, and a small little Kashmiri piece, probably around 5th to early 6th century AD, um, which I recently secured for the Met. From, um, and you can see the scale of, the, of the, uh, the lightning thunderbolt element here. It's a small piece, five or six inches, um, exceedingly rare, early, and important in terms of understanding how the Vajra evolved into the form we know of it today, as you'll see in the exhibition downstairs. It continues and it brings us into Nepal. So on the left, we have this very important image of it's probably late seventh, beginnings of eighth century uh, sandstone sculpture from Bihar, South Bihar, south of the Ganges in Eastern India, um, a very early representation of Vajrapani, uh, the Bodhisattva for holding the Vajra. Now, those of you who take some interest in South Asian iconography will be surprised by this image because to all intents and purposes he has this wild dreadlocks of hair, he has asymmetrical earrings, uh, he has a personified figure, uh, a weapon or some um, apparatus which has taken a personified form, a sort of uh, club bearing figure down here. These, without the Buddhist inscription, which is a very, a very clear early Bengali, proto-Bengali inscription, which makes clear its Buddhist affiliation. And without the Vajra, uh, you could mistake this figure for a Shiva. And many of the earliest representations we have, are particularly of Avalokiteshvara, the great embodiment of compassion in uh, Buddhist uh, iconography um, in this latter part of the first millennium AD, um, shares much of the iconographic language of Hinduism to do with Shiva. Uh, this is quite an extraordinary crossover. Um, and this cross-current and exchange that goes on between Buddhism and, and Brahmanical teachings in this early period is very, is very pronounced. Um, on, the, sorry, on the right, 
a very beautiful diminutive uh, bronze Litchavi period, probably again around 7th or 8th century at the very end of the first documented dynasty of the Kathmandu Valley. The Litchavis were almost certainly a minor branch of the Gupta family, who were the great Guptas of North India. Um, they needed some territory of their own. They couldn't. Uh, they, they, they were the junior junior branch of the family. They made their made their way into the Kathmandu Valley, established the Lichavi dynasty, and the art they produced, uh, in many ways, uh, preserves and, in a sense, almost fossilizes Gupta style, frozen in time. Um, uh, things happening in the Kathmandu centuries after that style is. Uh, been, uh, over, made redundant in India, still continuing in the valley in its own nuanced way. Um, and a very uh, early representation, probably the earliest bronze we know from the Kathmandu Valley of Vajrapani holding the thunderbolt element here. And then this little triad, um, pressed clay, polychromed, um, which um, Nothing so special in the, as a, as a standard uh, iconographic grouping, the Buddha flanked by two of the Bodhisattva saviour figures. But what is interesting is we, on, on the left as you view it, we have the, the Padmapani of Alakateshvara here with the lotus, and on the right, um, the representation uh, holding the Vajra of Vajrapani. This triad is an early form. It disappears later, and Vajrapani is displaced um, by, by Maitreya in, in later representations, but this early form is still there. And we have uh, the Ye Dharma uh, 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 mantra uh, uh, molded across, across the bottom. A little anecdote, this particular object was collected at Saparang Monastery in Western Tibet. Uh, this is the monastery uh, where we know Atisha was teaching um, in the early 11th century. This object is almost exactly in that time frame. So this is of the time when Atisha was in the same monastery, which is kind of neat. Um, it was also collected in 19, the early 1930s by Giuseppe Tucci, a great uh, uh, Tibetan, uh, sorry, in Italian Tibetologist, pioneer, um, and uh, published by him uh, in 1936, uh, in color, amazingly, um, and... Um, I recognized it um, when it was languishing in the bottom shelf of an auction house uh, uh, cabinet and secured it for the museum. A very important object um, to uh, bring in, into the public domain, into the corpus of material. Now, as I mentioned, um, at the center of Vajracharya, uh, Vajrayana ritual for the Buddhist community in Nepal is the consecration rituals that invest young young boys, um, usually led by their mothers, um, into um, ceremonies that lead to their inauguration as priests. Um, the rituals almost certainly have their antecedents in medieval Indian Buddhist practice, uh, and uh, there are textual foundations for this I won't, I won't uh, go into. Uh, the defining moment uh, in the steps of this induction for a young boy and their own seven, eight, nine, ten years old, generally quite young, is my understanding, um, and the novice is admitted to the Buddha path. Um, uh, the de defining moment is, is, is the consecration of the crown, puja, or ceremony, acharya, abhisheka. Uh, but bef before they enter into that ceremony, that induction, they must have already entered the monkhood with a monastic initiation ceremony um, so that they're nominally already monks before they take this higher, higher degree, this higher qualification. Um, and at the climax of the ceremony, of the Abhishek ceremony, the newly inducted Vatracharya has the crown placed on their head. And at that moment, they're understood to be empowered as transcendent Buddhas, as Bodhisattvas with the capacity uh, to uh, in, uh, share uh, awakening with, with, with others. Um, and uh, the, they have the uh, qualified, in a sense, to give ritual service uh, to, their, to their community. So here is a, a typical scene if you go to any of the major uh, uh, stupas in, in the Kathmandu Valley. Um, 
you'll see a, a Vajracharya priest generally not wearing the crown, I'm, I'm sorry to say. Uh, this is a photograph taken by uh, uh, Mary Slusa in 1960, uh, uh, who did, did pioneering work, and many of you will know her uh, great publication, Nepal Mandala, um, which brings together 20 years of her field work in, in the Kathmandu Valley in the 60s through to the mid-70s. Um, so here we have uh, the uh, Vajracharya uh, performing uh, upon request for clients, you approach, you uh, write your name on, on a piece of paper, uh, uh, some aspiration, um, pay a few rupees, and uh, uh, the, the ceremony is performed. Uh, this is the everyday uh, occurrence. I, I also uh, just show here uh, the Mandala uh, platform. This is a, a cast metal version. Here he's using a stone version, but these are essentially function as altars for these uh, uh, ceremonies. Now, once the Vajracharya is qualified, uh, he's entitled to perform uh, the Homa Puja, the fire uh, ritual puja, um, which is uh, uh, conducted in, in a, a temporarily constructed brick structure in which the fire is established. Here it's been invoked with colored powders um, and, you'll, and various offerings around. And you'll notice here is in fact one of the crowns uh, embedded with um, uh, Pigments and offerings um, and not, not, in, not, in, not in use. Um, the same ceremony we see in a, a probably late 17th century manuscript cover depiction in the upper panel. These are the two wooden covers that would sandwich the uh, palm leaf or paper folios of the sacred book in between. Um, and on the inner surfaces of those wooden covers, you'll see them in the exhibition, um, they were generally. Uh, paint very beautiful uh, illustrations to do with the uh, rituals that are described in the text, um, and uh, in this case, uh, portraits of the uh, donors who have commissioned the manuscript. Uh, so here we see um, uh, the Vajracharya, you'll notice he's wearing the crown, um, and here is the Homa altar in front for the fire altar. Uh, and uh, venerating the, the, the stupa, the donor family represented to the, to the right. <clears throat> I should perhaps say a word or two about um, the way in which Vajracharya is, in a sense, uh, function as, as Buddhist priests. Um, uh, it sounds a little bit like a contradiction in terms. We don't think of Buddhists. Buddhism as having priests as per se, and indeed they're not, um, but um, it, it is nonetheless uh, very, very analogous to, to uh, the ritual functions of, of Brahmins in a Hindu uh, context. Now, all of this takes place uh, in a context about which we know very little in subcontinental India, but it may be that it's simply been lost to us, and that is the pre prevalence in the Kathmandu Valley of urban monasteries, many of them what you could best describe as neighborhood monasteries. They're small, they're tucked away in little side alleys and streets, uh, they're just a, a, a small courtyard uh, with, with uh, buildings on, on four sides, at one entrance off a lane uh, leading uh, into it, um, and, and, and they serve a, a very localized community. But these nonetheless were uh, medieval monasteries, they've been well documented, these are the Baha or Bahi, um, and um, I show you on the screen on the left uh, a depiction of one of these monasteries uh, from a manuscript dated 1167. Uh, middle of the 12th century, this is the earliest depiction we have. Uh, it's in a very famous manuscript preserved in Cambridge University, the other Cambridge um, uh, uh, library. And what we're looking at here is uh, the Chachya, the uh, uh, stupa uh, in the courtyard. Um, and then uh, looking at one of the uh, elevations of, of the interior uh, structures and a monk at prayer. Um, and what he's almost certainly doing is uh, paying homage to the image which is installed in one of the chapels uh, in the uh, Bihar itself. Each one would have its own presiding uh, uh, bodhisattva and um, upstairs they would have uh, a restricted room for ritual objects, um, which only, only the initiated would be allowed access to. That's what it looks like in real life. This is um, 
Jusa Bahar in, in Kathmandu. Uh, it's a, quite a large Bahar, in fact, um, and um, in, in, in a beautiful condition. Um, I have to say, this is this was subjected to quite intense restoration by a German um, um, architectural program, uh, working closely with, with uh, Nepalese uh, partners. Um, and the, the joy of walking into something like this and say, oh, it's just had 10 years of renovation done to it, is you can't see anything because it's been so discreetly done Every tile that's been put back on the roof has been made in the traditional manner, put back in the correct way. The woodworking uh, which needed to be replaced has been done correctly, integrated back into it. Um, it's a model of, of, of uh, uh, responsible conservation. This uh, monastery, we're not sure when it began, but we do know that it enters the history books in the mid-17th century. Um, it was uh, either built at the initiative of the very famous early Mala king, Pratap Mala, uh, or it was extensively renovated in his lifetime uh, under his patronage. And so it has, um, it's a very, very important Baha um, within the, the heart of uh, the very busy uh, Kathmandu today, uh, mostly dating from the 16, 1670s. It houses this remarkable triad um, which, uh, which we see a Vajracharya crowned and with the ritual implements, the two essential implements, which are the, the Vajra, the lightning thunderbolt, and the bell, the Ganta, uh, which we've got in the exhibition, a beautiful pair downstairs. Um, uh, and what is important here is um, this particular individual is named in the inscription. We know who he is. Uh, Prahiya Deva Vajracharya, uh, and we know that he was the grandson of the founding Vajracharya, as far as the records tell us, uh, of this particular Baha. Um, and he's there presented with his two wives, and the work has been has a, a, a dated inscription, um, uh, which, which uh, uh, reads to equivalent to 1699. So we have very precise information, and for those of us that are curious about the chronology and dating of these crowns, we're going to be looking at in more detail in a moment, uh, evidence like this becomes very important. Um, uh, 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 an object with, with an integral date, the close of the 17th century, uh, with this particular crown figure configuration. And November 2017, and a thank you to, to Nourish. Vajracharya, um, I had the privilege of acting as the client for um, the performance of a rather extensive four-hour puja uh, with five Vajracharya priests in uh, Chosubaha um, uh, courtyard. And um, here they are uh, all setting up for the, for the occasion. <coughs> so this was the, what's called the sevenfold supreme offering uh, ritual, Sapta Vidya Natara Puja, um, and uh, the, the couple, um, uh, which this gentleman is, is, is part, uh, were the, uh, acted as my surrogates, as it were, for the, uh, for the ritual itself. You'll notice when the, in the preparations they were making for the ceremony, they each have their crowns laid out before them, along with various offerings. And I want to quote for you from um, uh, uh, Geldner's translate. Uh, uh, translation of a Guru Mandala uh, manual, which is the, essentially the textbook for uh, practitioners. Um, and this is what it says. Wear this great crown so that you and all the Buddhas will be worshipped. This crown, which has arisen from the five Buddha families and adorned with the crest jewel of the Buddhas, wear it to save all beings. So we have the five officiating priests uh, performing uh, the sevenfold supreme offering ritual, um, and they're understood to embody the five transcendent Buddhas. Um, and these are the five Buddhas that we'll see in a moment are represented on the crowns themselves um, and, and have very particular functions. So we have uh, first Akshobhya, um, if I go, you can see it a bit better here, um, uh, who is dressed in blue, or mauvey blue as it were, 
um, uh, and faces east, um, and uh, generally in represented in the sculptures of the uh, earth touching mudra, the, uh, uh, the Ratna Sambhava, who faces south, uh, dressed in yellow, um, the rising midday sun, um, wish granting uh, gestures, Amitabha facing west the red colored garments, uh, the setting sun, the intensity of the setting sun, and yogic meditation, Amagha Siddha facing north, dressed in green, um, come the coming of the night, um, and a protective mudra, and then presiding over those four as Varochana, who was regarded as the uh, presiding uh, supreme um, being um, who in the crowns is generally represented you have four in the four directions and the fifth uh, represented ab above. And here we have um, one of the five priests who was performing on this particular occasion uh, in, in preparation for the ritual, uh, some, med some meditation. Here are the two uh, key ritual, uh, well here we have the Vajra and the Ganta as you have downstairs, uh, together with the conch shell for pouring uh, libations. Uh, it's a ritual dispenser for, um, it goes back to the notion of Abhishek, the uh, ordination, coronation, confirmation through the pouring of water over the, over the recipient. Um, and uh, the conch is, is the, the vehicle for this and clearly has, because it comes from the sea, um, has uh, water, water symbolism uh, embedded in it. Now you'll notice these crowns are all new, or pretty new, um, and uh, there is a, Nawaris of course are the greatest uh, metal workers in, 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 in South Asia and arguably one of the greatest traditions of metal workers in the world, in certainly the medieval world. Um, and um, they continue that in the making of these crowns uh, today. But the crowns themselves go back a long way, um, and we can take them right back to the 12th century, in fact. Much of what we're concerned with, with the five uh, transcendent Buddhas represented by the five um, Vajracharyas, um, is uh, a configuration four plus one, which gives you a mandala uh, construction four directional points and one vertical point. Um, that's what we see created ritually here in the preparation for the puja, and it's what we see embodied in ritual objects, such as this uh, model of, sort of Mount Meru uh, cosmology. It's a three-dimensional mandala, also, also Nepalese. The crowns themselves um, are, are Relatively uh, complex construction, they're uh, uh, conical or stepped uh, sheet copper um, um, helmet, shall we call it, um, with uh, decorated elements, uh, cast and, and but principally repoussé elements riveted into position. Um, and um, they're especially elaborate, as you can see, they, they receive inlaid precious metals, lapis lazuli, gemstones, and so on. Um, in their original constructions. What is on the screen um, is uh, the oldest documented uh, crown that we know of. Um, it, it's dated to uh, 265 of Nepal Samvat era in the reign of Narendra Deva, uh, famous uh, king of the mid 12th century in, in Nepal, um, dates equivalent to 1145. Um, extraordinarily uh, beautiful and powerful object. Um, the date, is, there's no ambiguity in the reading of the inscription. We have the uh, rain dates of the king confirmed from other sources. It's a very secure uh, date to begin the chronology, mid 12th century. And around that time, give or take 50 years, in Orissa, we could repeat the story in Bengal or Bihar, uh, we get representations of meditation bodhisattva figures wearing crowns of conical form with these added uh, representations of the transcendent Buddhas, um, the presiding Varachana above, and in this case, um, because this is an Avalokiteshvara image, uh, the, the presiding Amitabha Buddha at the very top. This is a standard iconographic program um, in which we see the, the uh, 
crowns which must have existed and been used in ritual practice at the time in, in India, subcontinental India, which no examples have come down to us that we can recognize as being Indian, unless some of the early ones known about from Nepal are in fact from India. We don't, we don't know. We can't really venture into expressing an opinion on that. But nonetheless, it's very clear that these crowns were in ritual use um, in 10th, 11th, and especially 12th century Eastern India, as witnessed by, the, by these sculptures. And bring you in a little closer, here you have very clearly um, the repeated images of the uh, directional uh, bodhisattvas, uh, the presiding Varochana and the uh, parent, parent Buddha for Avalokiteshvara, represented at the top. And that configuration, which is quite a rare one, in fact, in terms of crowns, does appear on one crown. This is a crown dated uh, to the late 17th century. It's 1677. It's in the v &A in London. Uh, it has the uh, same configuration, and, but it also has, unusually, the presiding uh, Amitabha Buddha at the very summit, seated on the crossed Vajras, um, exactly as we're seeing here, um, even though it's uh, some... Uh, 400 years later. But one can see a continuity in the tradition very clearly. Not so far removed. <laughs> well, we must remember, and I'll I just say something very uh, it's common knowledge, but just those of you, it's not your field. Buddhism in India was essentially a spent force by the end of the 12th century. It was dead on its feet by the second decade of the 13th century, with one or two minor exceptions. Um, it, it had really run out of steam um, and therefore wasn't very difficult to be trampled on by um, a resurgent, bhakti-driven Hinduism. Um, uh, coming of Islam didn't help either. The cumulative effect of all of these things meant that Buddhism really expired in its country of origin. It lived on, of course, outside India uh, and has been reintroduced back. Uh, so the traditions that we're witnessing in the Kathmandu Valley arguably echo uh, practices in India which have simply been lost to us. Uh, they, we know they shared the same textual basis, um, informed by the same ritual manuals. Uh, many of these are known from the 11th and 12th centuries, um, but uh, we have no very little material uh, evidence um, of ritual practice. The only descriptions we have of everyday life in a monastery um, come from the Chinese pilgrims who left incredibly useful uh, descriptions of daily rituals of life in a monastery, 5th, 6th, 7th, early 8th centuries. Um, uh, and they talk about uh, the daily life, of uh, monastic life, is, it's, that's probably the closest we'll ever get to having a real insight into, into how that was organized. The corpus of inscriptions tell us quite a lot, particularly about patronage. Um, uh, Gregory Chopin's famous term, monks and money. It was all about the monks' business, how do monasteries run as enterprises. You know, you can't live on you know, the smell of a manuscript alone. You need money to build masonry, to build stupas, to feed the community, and so on. There's, there's an economic underpinning that goes with all of this. Um, how, how did that work? So all of much of that is lost to us. Um, and, um, but still, we can uh, start to reconstruct a little bit. And this is where uh, the practices of the Kathmandu, the Kathmandu Valley are uh, unique um, and um, give us insights which are otherwise completely uh, closed to us. 10th century Dunhuang, Central Asia, um, and um, Essentially, I'm going to say Chinese, but it's Central Asian so you, as opposed to Chinese. Uh, from Dunhuang, we see the five transcendent Buddhas configured with the central Varochana and the four surrounding, or color coded, as we discussed, uh, gesture coded as well. Each mudra, hand gesture, is defining of each figure. Um, and they're in a, a mandala uh, construction, um, classic uh, example of, of 10th century uh, Central Asian Buddhist practice. We know that there were significant Tibet, Tibetan and Himalayan uh, uh, populations in Central Asia at, at these large international 
monasteries like Dunhuang and others. So these were really cosmopolitan places in terms of the Buddhist diaspora. People were drawn from all over. Um, and so something like this is important. Um, I point, just pay a little attention to the construction of the uh, crowns themselves. They're very distinctive and very clear. And if you come in close, um, we, here just uh, mid 12th century, 1235, sorry, 1135, um, uh, first dated crown, as you saw a moment ago, and here uh, you can see the construction is essentially the same. They're very clear, a diadem around the forehead, the uh, added elements uh, with the uh, bodhisattvas, the half vajra projection, which often uh, functions as if to represent Virochana, uh, something is not represented in uh, human form, but represented by the half vajra projecting from the cranium right there up through the spine. It's a projection uh, of, of his four physical form. Um, and so here we have very clear evidence that this crown type in the 10th century had already permeated a wider Buddhist uh, uh, diaspora. Where did these crown types come from? And now I'm venturing into rather controversial territory, um, but let me just say this is, um, I couldn't resist this one. Um, this is to, not to argue that what we're seeing when you look at uh, the, the great mural paintings from Ajanta in the late fifth century, 470s, 475, if you uh, follow um, uh, Walter Spink's datings, um, in which we see the great so-called Padmapani represented with this glorious uh, crown type. What's on the screen is not, in my view, what uh, is not that. But it may well be the prototype for crowns that morphed into the ritual crowns later. Um, and had this, all, this added sets of meaning placed on it. But the original crown type, which I would argue is secular, I would argue this is princely, this is courtly, this is what the Vakataka uh, super rich royalty wore to show off their wealth and power, crowns of this, of this type. Um, and so it's, and it's been appropriated in, into a religious context. Here it is on a Buddhist uh, bodhisattva figure. But I, I, I wouldn't for a moment suggest that it has the whole set of meaning that goes with the Vajracharya crown in the fifth century, not at all. But the crown type, where did this crown type come from? Very likely in a lineage that grows out of this, I would suggest. Um, and where does the conical, this curious conical, you know, pointy hat idea, where does that come from? Um, which brings me to my, there we have it, um, not so far removed. A couple of other versions. Which brings me to my next point, the pointy hat idea, the pointed crown element, has a remarkable resemblance to the way in which hair is worn in India by people who are understood to embody wisdom. If you look at, um, you look at all the people in, through Indian history who have long braided hair, um, wound up into a top knot, if you like, an elaborate um, cranium extension, um, uh, be they rishis, or be they sadhus, or be they mahasiddhas, um, or the, uh, the Buddha himself um, in, in post-Nirvana representations, they have this cranium projection. What I would suggest and again, I'm in slightly dangerous territory here, um, is what that represents, arguably, uh, and what the crowns represent, um, is the matted hair itself. It would have been turned into something formal, which you can wear, as opposed to having to have dreadlocks all the time. So here we have uh, this glorious Nepalese, probably 10th century, um, image of, of Maitreya holding the flask, um, and here the braided hair wound up into a top knot, um, which of course is not, not very different uh, to the crowns themselves. So um, if you accept that um, piled up hair on the head and uh, um, 
which we know goes back to the very earliest images of ascetics and uh, guru figures. Shiva is the Mahaguru. He is the great guru of early India. That's not early India, of India, full stop. Um, and um, wears, these, you know, of course, these great uh, dreadlocks. Here we have uh, Surya, no, Chandra, actually, sorry. Um, and again, the, you'll notice the hair, the tiered conical hair behind the diadem. The diadem's in front with its five panels, um, and behind that is the, the piled up, uh, this black element of the piled up hair uh, being worn as a, I would suggest, as a wisdom symbol. I mentioned diadems, which brings me to another point, which is we have the crowns, very distinctive uh, uh, part of the ritual of Vajracharas in Nepal, but we have another parallel tradition, which is not of a helmet-like crown, but of a diadem, which has moving parts. So uh, they're usually, uh, they can be the very earliest ones we think were wooden. It's a very early Kashmiri example. One panel of, there would have been five originally, drilled to receive binding. They would have been tied with a leather thread or twine of some sort. Um, and they're flexible. You can fold them up, put them in your day pack and go off to do your priestly duty. Um, and here is a complete one, um, uh, as it will be worn. Um, these were almost certainly part of the early tradition in Nepal as well, but they largely only, largely today, part of the tr Tibetan tradition, much less for Nepal. But uh, this, the diadem, um, we rarely see these types of crowns, the conical helmet crowns in Tibet, but we, you routinely see this type of diadem being worn. So there's two traditions uh, competing here as well. There's another very beautiful single panel. These are all from the Metz collection. And then, if you look at this remarkable uh, piece, probably 10th century, um, the seated Manjushri figure, and look closely at the detail of the uh, uh, crown. Again, it's the, uh, the, essentially here, it's the diadem type that we've just been, just been discussing. If you go to uh, Ukubaha, the golden Baha in Patan, for example, uh, in each of the corners are four extraordinary one metre high copper images of bodhisattvas. Three at least are, I think, contemporary and original. One is probably a replacement a century or two later. It's still old, um, but the original ones are probably... Stick a pin in the, in the donkey. Well, 10th century, I mean, you know, they're extremely early... Uh, objects um, and what of course they what they give you is extreme beautifully detailed renderings of these diadem um, uh, decorate uh, crowns with the, with the with the panels um, very very explicit and they're still making them today as I, I said earlier this is in the same monastery they were just doing a clean-up before a ceremony. So they're being washed and cleaned um, in order to dress the images. These are adornments for images, not for people to wear. Um, and um, we see them here all being uh, prepared for a festival and, and given, a, given a good clean. And uh, they're used on images like this uh, during the uh, relevant festivals. Now, I want to take you right back. The image on the left, uh, we're now back in India. We're in Nalanda. If any of you know the names of the great early monasteries of India, Nalanda was the powerhouse of medieval Indian Buddhism. It was the great university of Buddhism in India, the intellectual powerhouse. Um, this object is almost certainly from Nalanda, 10th century. It's a four-faced Virochana form, which has a textual authority, um, and he's wearing... Um, he's uh, engaged in, has, is holding a Vajra, uh, I think it's a Gunta, a gunta with, with Vajra handle, um, uh, wisdom, compassion uh, gesture, um, seated on a, I've cropped this too tight, lotus space and then a lion throne uh, beneath. Um, and the crown uh, is, again, exactly the type of crown type that we've been discussing uh, here on this four-headed in a sense, is embodying all of the transcendent Buddhas in one form. 
as the presiding uh, uh, overlord of the other Bodhisattva, so to speak. This extraordinary image, probably also 10th century, a variant form of Vajrapani, um, quite extraordinary, um, great enormous energy, um, probably produced in the 900s. And uh, let me just uh, show you the detail uh, of the crown that's being worn. It's very explicit, it's very clear. They're in the same, we're in the same territory here. Um, the four directional Buddhas, the fifth presiding um, above the gem-encrusted diadem band around the forehead and so on. Uh, the ribbons that tie it and then uh, fly away, which are paint highlighted in, in color and so on. Uh, classic um, uh, evidence, I think, for the prevalence of these crowns in ritual use in the 10th century. Chakrasambhara uh, image uh, in the Mets collection, again, very, very powerful Tibetan piece that we get a Nepalese equivalence uh, again uh, the diadem element is, is very clearly here. And one crown, the crown that you're exhibiting downstairs, um, is um, a wonderful crown. It's uh, our best, dare I say. Um, uh, we have several in the museum. This is our best crown. Um, but it's also an unusual crown in that it's, it doesn't represent the standard iconography of the four plus one, five transcendent Buddhas. It's in fact uh, dedicated to an esoteric form of Manjushri, Manju Vajra. Um, and uh, he's wrathful, he's wielding a sword um, in a, in a, and uh, standing in a wrathful pose, as you can, can see here. Um, and um, it, it clearly uh, is, is not, not main, it's not a mainstream object, but um, Man Manjushri is very important in the Kathmandu Valley, uh, linked to creation myths and other things. Um, and we know there was a very powerful cult to do with Manjushri in medieval uh, esoteric Buddhist India. Um, here, uh, uh, this extraordinary stele, many of you all know from them, it's been on permanent display on the Met for many decades. Um, it's the most complete representation you'll ever get of a medieval Mahavihara, a great monastery, all this superstructure and so on. Uh, this is what the monuments, of which we only have foundations surviving, this is what the structures must have looked like. And here we have this esoteric form of Manjushri uh, with the noose and the sword and so on, multi-armed, uh, hands crossed on the chest for uh, wisdom, compassion. Um, and not only large-scale images like this, but bronzes two inches high, little portable bronzes you can take, you can tuck it into your waist cloth, take it anywhere. Um, so totally portable uh, images, uh, immensely powerful, um, embodying um, uh, this particular cult. Manjushri was important. Um, here we have, uh, again, a parlor piece on the left. Um, and on the right, a folio from a palm leaf manuscript. It's not dated, but it's going to be 10th, 11th century territory uh, from um, Varanasi um, the Museum, the University Museum. Um, and um, here we have uh, a Manjushri mandala, the five emanations appearing in a mandala uh, configuration. Reverence for wisdom uh, translates into all sorts of things, including reverence for those who embody knowledge, but also reverence for the vehicle for the knowledge, which is the manuscript or the book. So uh, the veneration of the book becomes an important aspect of daily worship. Uh, so we see it here in this little detail on the upper screen. That's down here. Okay, lower right. And what we're, what we're witnessing is an Acharya, a Buddhist uh, uh, priest. Notice the pointy hat. It's the helmet again. Uh, a devotee. And this curious construction, which in fact is a stem table, and with a manuscript, a book, resting on it. Long horizontal landscape format palm leaf book, um, wooden covers. That's what we see on the lower screen. Here it's got they're covered in copper and inlaid. 
Um, that's, that's essentially what we're seeing in the upper register. Worshipping, worshipping's too strong a word, venerating the wisdom embodied in the book. When I started working on this, this sort of subject uh, triggered by the acquisition of that crown you have downstairs, um, I had a very wonderful intern one summer, and I said, hunt down all the crowns you can find globally. We ended up with 35 or something uh, in collections outside Nepal. Um, and then we chased up how many are inscribed and dated. It's a tiny number. It's grown a little bit since I did that work. I've added two, I think. Um, but still, it's a very small number. And it's a, to me, it's surprising because all of these crowns were commissioned as gifts to individuals. Um, and they remain the property of the individual or their descendants. They're not communal temple property or monastery property. They are the property of the families uh, to whom they were presented to the ind individual Vajracharya. Um, and some of them carry very explicit dedications to my revered, you know, Vajracharya, da da da, or I present this on this date at this particular Baha, the monastery, they name the place. We know most of the locations of those monasteries named in the inscriptions. Um, so uh, we have a fairly complete picture, yet the vast majority of crowns are not inscribed. And for me, this is a great sort of puzzle, uh, which I have no answer. This is, again, just to quickly, I'll take you through the uh, principal um, crowns. We know the uh, 1135, as Gime, the, the Mets example, uh, this was collected in 19... This entered the Met in 1906. The probability that it was part of the Young Husband expedition in 1904 is very high, though we don't know for a fact its provenance. Um, but access to Nepal and Tibet beginning the 20th century and earlier was extremely limited. Some of you will know, go and Google Young Husband Expedition. It's a, a very defining moment in terms of... Um, uh, it was a bit like the, what, 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 you sent gunboats to Japan, was it, in the 1860s or something? You know, forced diplomacy, yeah, Perry, was it? Yeah, I mean, that, that sort of thing. Um, they sent an expeditionary force from Calcutta. It was a bit of a long walk. Um, these crowns appear in dated paintings. We have several. Uh, I'm running short of time now, so we have uh, two in the Met, both 14th century which is very, very early, um, both of which show um, in the bottom register um, the priest performing the ritual um, and the family who commissioned the ritual in attendance, all represented, named, and so on. Um, there's, there's several of these preserved in the Potala and Lhasa. Um, they found their way into Tibet, but almost certainly Nepalese in origin and manufacture. Uh, this is your piece. Another dated piece in the late 17th century in the Metz collection. This is uh, 1680s, um, now in Chicago. Uh, this is V&A, this is 1677. Um, and what's remarkable about this piece is it has a long inscription which had never been read beyond the date, which is the easy bit to pull out, the numerals. Um, but the inscription states very clearly that this crown was made in Lhasa, the capital of Tibet, not Nepal, made in Lhasa to be presented to a monastery back in Kathmandu. So it has to be Nawari merchants living in, doing on the, the Nepal-Tibet trade, living in Lhasa, expats living in Lhasa, doing nice business, and sending a crown, a very expensive crown, back to Nepal to give to their, their hometown monastery um, for the benefit of their family and all their descendants. So very, very interesting. I mean, it opens up a whole vista of the dynamics going on uh, in this region. And I think that's perhaps where I should stop because it's now 6.30. Well, up to you. <laughs> um, is that a good place to um, There's a little bit more. Please go. Oh, okay, just a little bit. Okay. So, um, uh, one of the Mets pieces, this is uh, 
dated late 17th century. Um, and what's interesting is we don't have representations of the Vajracharyas. We have uh, lotuses represented, um, uh, five, to invoke the, um, uh, the, the presence uh, of the Bodhisattvas. And two, uh, uh, have two crowns, both from the 1860s. Um, like this is 1864, and uh, like the, more or less the same. Um, and um, you can see how this tradition continued on a little impoverished uh, compared to what it was, was before. Um, but, um, and I just wanted yes, to conclude really by going back to the, uh, the dated um, uh, portrait sculpture from 1699 on the left from Trusabaha um, and the crown um, uh, on, on the right uh, dated 18 years later only. Um, uh, in, in the Met Mets collection, and you can see the continuity of tradition that's taking place. Thank you. Thank you for giving this presentation on the history of crowns in um, South Asia. Something that fascinated me, or like something that like captured like my attention, was when the 11th century crowned clay piece that was collected by an Italian person in the 1980s. I was wondering like what you meant by the word like collected and how these pieces like end up in the museums and if sure. the people who are, um, if the people who are living there are receiving a portion of what the museums are getting from this. Um, okay, I'll do my best because my hearing is not perfect. Um, so I'll try and get the gist of your question. Um, define collecting uh, as opposed to appropriation, exploitation, uh, colonial ripoff, or whatever. All of those, th there are elements of all of those things historically, of course. Um, which object were we referring to? Which p date was it? The one in the 1980s, you said it was founded in auction house, brought to a public domain by an Italian person. That was, I think that was the three, um, like I, like the three, the, the trifle, I don't know, like I like, it was either that or like, Oh, yes, indeed. Right. OK, so um, my apologies. Yeah, so this is um, a little clay triad, um, which um, Giuseppe Tucci, who did uh, much of this pioneering work, um, field work in uh, Tibet in the 1920s through to the 1940s, um, collected many things. And uh, according to his published accounts, he bought them at the monasteries from the monks for money. OK, now. We can't verify that, the man's dead, um, but that, that is what the, the written record says. Um, and um, most of that material sits in, in a foundation institute in Rome, uh, where it is intensively studied. Um, some things were retained by the family and circulated uh, after his death in the art trade, including that, that small piece. Um, and uh, it was our good fortune that I recognized it for what it was. Uh, and uh, secured, in my opinion, we rescued it, um, brought it into the public arena uh, where it's fully accessible to everybody, including online, um, uh, accessible globally. Um, an object that otherwise had been off radar for decades and probably would have gone off radar again for a very long time. So, um, but every case has its own story. That's not, um, we can't generalize from that, but that's the story with that particular piece. About midway through, you said that the crowns were usually um, given to a singular person and they were not for communal use, but rather for the individual's use. Um, and then a bit in this last section of the presentation, you said how um, the one that was made in Tibet and shipped back was given to a monastery um, sort of in general. So- No, no sorry, I wasn't specific enough. No. Um, the one that was made in Tibet and sent back to, to Kathmandu in the 1677, um, the, the priest for whom it was uh, destined was named. 
Yeah, yeah, sorry, I, I wasn't explicit enough. So um, they're always given to an individual, sometimes by the extended family, sometimes by just a devotee, um, and, um, but usually they're to their community uh, Baha, the community monastery. Um, uh, but they remain, re, re, forgive, forgive me if I'm wrong, but I, my understanding is they're retained by the family and they pass by descent through the family, uh, and essentially a private property. Um, unlike many other things which are clearly communal property and belong to the entity of the temple or the monastery um, and, and belong to the community. That's a different category of object. I have a question about you. Sure. Um, when you were talking about the mounding of hair. Oh, can you hear me? All right. Um, when you were talking about the mounding of hair, um, and your theory or your belief is that it was symbolic of what? Just the crown shape? Because I'm wondering yeah. if it isn't symbolic is a, of the chakra, the crown chakra, yeah, and yes. then you see that whole shape bleed over into the Vatican and the hats that the Pope and the Cardinals wear. This is the, the fun of doing lectures as opposed to having to write something down because you can t take risks. But I'm suggesting that um, the prevalence of dreadlocks and long matted hair in India is as old as we have images in India. It goes right back to the beginning and it's consistently associated with higher knowledge and wisdom. So it's just kind of, and I think the, if you know your Buddhist iconography, the bump on the head of the Buddha is what's called the Oshnisha, um, is exactly that. I think it's representing that higher knowledge which was normally the, the bound up hair. The dreadlocks, that are, you know, the braids that are bound up into a conical sh shape. Um, and so I was floating the idea, well, where does this very pointy crown idea come from? I mean, why not, why couldn't it just absolutely be a, you know, a formalization of this notion of the wisdom represented by uh, a towering um, bun? That's all. <laughs> And I could be shot down completely. It might, it might, you know, but, but you know, there might be a text that says something completely different. But. I have a follow-up question to that. So let me just preface this by saying that I'm a Western medieval art historian, so I may be completely misunderstanding what's going on. But it seems like your argument is that the long matted hair of the ascetics is then brought into the vocabulary of secular kingship and from there into these Buddhist religious crowns. Is that the, the flow that you're suggesting? Kingship in India is kind of a bit complicated because um, from the very earliest conventions for defining kingship, it was always understood to be divine. And um, so much of the symbolism for kingship is what we would recognize as sacred symbolism. And they cross over, this cross, enormous crossover. Um, and um, I mean, the Buddha himself, if you read the accounts of his last, you know, the late sermons before he died, he talked about um, he was to be treated as if a Vajracharya, as if a, a world monarch, a secular king, um, and to be buried in the same manner as a world king, um, treated like royalty, in other words. And this gets. This doesn't translate into art for a very long time, but in the medieval period, in 10th, 12th century in India, it does, because you start to get crowned Buddhas. Images which you'd think were Bodhisattvas, but they're not. They're actually Buddhas wearing royal regalia, um, which is a literal take on the original Sermon of the Buddha, uh, but hadn't ever been you know, pursued before, uh, becomes a new iconographic uh, motif. Right. And okay, carries so over then to Thailand and other places. So there isn't a contradiction then, but a transfer really. There, there's sort of a continuation of meaning, uh, that it starts out as this meaning of wisdom and then moves into a sphere of world kingship and then brought into there and sort of broadened. Right, yes, yeah, so I did, just to finish that point. So images for kingship in India are very much the Buddhist notion of kingship is uh, ruling by divine wisdom um, uh, and the ideal is to rule by the power of wisdom alone, by dharma, no force, no military, no coercion. 
Um, and um, so to do that, you've got to be extremely wise. So you see how the ideas come together. So um, I think there's a, there's a way in which these ideas weave together, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, thank you very much, John. And, Pleasure. Uh, delightful. Thank you.